Let's go back in time to 1932 as Converse brings you historic footage of the legendary original Celtics with whom all great professional teams are compared. We have now taken over your radio. Richie Guerin is about to show you the most important step in getting past a man. It's the first one. An Oscar will inbound it. The men in green, the Milwaukee Bucks, that's Al Cinder against Bellamy. It has Jordan. Allen shakes free. Gets two! Gilmore. to go in the first quarter for the Cow Palace. Here's Barry. Jordan. Open. Chicago with the lead. Hello and welcome to the Over and Back Classic NBA podcast. I am Jason Mann. Uh, usually with me is Rich Krejci, but he has is he's on assignment uh, this time. We'll say, and so uh, joining me is the uh, Hardwood Paroxysm editor in chief, Ian Levy. He also runs the uh, Nylon Cal- Calculus Advanced Statistics blog, and also is the host of the R Squared podcast, which is also part of the Podium Game Network. And uh, Ian, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, so uh, we've looked uh, at uh, snapshots of uh, the current players f- uh, from the top 50, the greatest players uh, list made in 1996, along with Curtis Harris. We've kind of given our initial impressions, both using uh, some statistics, mostly win shares and win shares per 48, but a, a few others as well, um, and you know, and anecdotal evidence, uh, historical cases, that perspective coming from Curtis uh, primarily. <laughs> Uh, you know, next we're going to be kind of looking at the um, both the post nineteen ninety six players and also reexamine some of the cases of the current guys in the top fifty who you know maybe um, we need to look at more deeply who we haven't really kind of made a firm decision on. And uh, so we're relying on, on stats a lot. So we thought we'd have you on the show who is you know well versed in statistics and kind of talk about some of the strengths and limitations of what the numbers can tell us. Great. Yeah, I um, definitely uh, uh, historical eras are not my area of expertise. I'm, I'm much more well versed in the in the current crop of NBA players. But um, yeah, I, I definitely have some thoughts. I'm excited to talk about it. So so let's say you are looking at a player of the past that you're probably, you know, that you're not real familiar with. Um you know, what are some of the things that you are going to look at from a numbers perspective to try to, you know, c- kind of give some evaluation um, for them? Um, well, there's sort of there's two avenues. So one is I want to understand uh, what kind of player they were. Um, and then, you know, if you want to put them in, sort of into a into a historical framework or into a some sort of ranking framework, you want to uh, think about how good they were compared to their contemporaries and maybe compared to, you know, uh, the larger pool of, of, of uh, players in the history of the NBA. So uh, obviously basketball reference is the starting point. Their player pages are rich and they go all the way back. Um, so thinking about what kind of a what kind of player um this person was I'd look at their their player page and I and I'd be examining everything I could find there so um, you know even for players way back where there's not a lot of video available just the statistics can inform somewhat uh, about like the style that the the player played so maybe they're a big um, but they have a lot of balance between rebounds and assists or blocks and steals and that sometimes that's an indicator of a player who can sort of slide back and forth between roles and who could play on the inside and could also play on the perimeter a little bit Um, if they're uh, you know a big man who maybe has a a low free throw total that's uh, or a low free throw number of free throw attempts that's maybe an indicator that they were more of a jump shooter or somebody who played a little bit on the outside Um, so things like that can sort of give you a little bit of, of information about the way that a player played um, and I think all of those things are really important about um, understanding um, understanding the, the style of play, uh, putting that into the historical context of, of you know, the era that they played in. Um, and then, you know, uh, things like how long their career lasted and how long their prime was. Um, those are things that can help inform sort of from a larger evaluative standpoint. Yeah, you know, one thing that uh, has always vexed me a little bit is 
the, the, ver, you know, the longevity versus the, the peak, you know, how, mm-hmm. how, how much we value, you know, being very, very good for a long time versus being great for a, a shorter time. And that, mm-hmm. that's always kind of a difficult way to, you know, to, to weigh some of these. And I'm sure that this is going to be something that we're going to have to consider when talking about, you know, the, maybe the last five or so guys on, on, on our top 50 and, and kind of, you know, weighing those two factors, because that's definitely a, a, a difficult thing. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to become increasingly relevant with when you want to talk about the current crop of players, because, it, you know, technology technological advances and an understanding of rest and health and and injury and all of those things it seems like top players are having longer and longer careers and longer and longer primes you take somebody like Dirk Nowitzki who um you know arguably was maybe only a top five player in the league for for maybe one or two seasons but was in the top 10 for you know more than a decade now and his prime you know uh his prime has just sort of slowly, slowly, slowly ebbed away. Um, and and so you sort of have to take that into account about, uh, yeah, there's sort of the shape of a player's career arc. I think it's a really interesting question. Yeah, and I mean, you, you know, pre-1990, there's, you know, maybe a handful of guys who were effective players, you know, after age 35. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, Kareem, Moses Malone, um, Elvin Hayes, uh, you know, a couple others. But that's really, you know, that's really about it. And now, you know, we've this generation has, you know, a number of guys who are still really, you know, great players in their late 30s. And probably, you know, I imagine we'll have more as it goes along. So that's, you know, that's the thing. I mean, that's another thing is that um, I, I want to try to avoid, and I, I believe Rich feels the same way, um, of having the weight tilted too far toward modern players because, you know, both because of the longevity and both because, you know, as the game has evolved, you know, some of the statistical measures, you know, they've just improved in those things. I mean, people shoot better than they used to. Um, You know, they're, they're, they're more athletic. They're just able to produce, you know, at high levels, there's obviously exceptions, but you know um, for the most part, um, you know, you know, what are some ways to kind of, um, you know, you could consider, you know, sort of the different, um, eras in, in, in both and not, you know, um, like for one, one example I thought that was good was Curtis Harris looked at an example like J- Jermaine O'Neal, like Jermaine O'Neal uh-huh. had such a long career and was, you know, pretty good player for a while that he's just so high on, you know, let's say the level of, you know, wind shares and even wind shares per 48, he's probably pretty strong too. How do you avoid like, you know, um, rewarding guys like that? Not that he's quite a top 50 candidate, but rewarding guys who maybe are kind of have that case while uh, pe- avoiding penalizing somebody who, you know, didn't have that longevity, but was, you know, almost certainly a better player, but maybe it doesn't quite show it. You know, you don't quite see it in the numbers. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a balance, right? So you want to take the statistics. And if you're, if you're talking about something like building a list of the 50, 50 greatest players, you want to take the, the cultural context and the, the cultural importance of players um, and balance that with the statistics. So, you know, somebody like Jermaine O'Neal will maybe look great by win share measures in part because he's playing 82 game seasons. You know, I mean, he's been injured, but he's playing 82 game seasons for his whole career, which is more opportunities um, to rack up win shares. Um, and that's, you know, that's another advantage that that modern players have when with regards to something like win shares it's a cumulative statistic uh more minutes more games means more opportunities to accrue win shares um so maybe you look at win shares and you're looking at you know their peaks and and uh so not just their total but what were their what were their peak seasons like and how do those peak seasons compare to players before and then you know you want to balance the t- statistics with understanding how important was this player at the time that they played um you know uh basketball reference has a numeric formula that rates the um that rates the likelihood of players being inducted into the hall of fame. And it uses some statistics, some of the player statistics, but it also uses things like all-star game selections, uh, MVP voting, um, you know, all NBA selections, all NBA defensive selections, things like those. Um, and so, so 
those are some ways that you can sort of compare the player to their peers at the time that they played. The other thing that's interesting is, you know, if, if, if cultural importance is, is part of the formula, there are some players whose cultural performance is probably elevated by the fact that they only played for a short time and, you know, and, and maybe sort of flamed out quickly. Um, you know, Yao Ming, uh, you know, is a case where he, you know, he was here, he was dominant when he could be on the court and he didn't last that long. And the fact that our image of him is just sort of these brief dominant seasons and then, you know, and then he was gone. We sort of, you know, maybe not having the chance to sort of watch him break down slowly over seven or eight years. Maybe that makes him seem better and more important or, or whatever than he, you know, maybe would have been if we had watched him over a full career. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I mean, and Bill Walton is certainly, uh, you know, very much yeah. the, the, the the case of that where, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he was so good, but, but for a relatively short time. And, you know, the, I think the cultural importance, um, it, it kind of gives him the boost on, you know, on, on the original top 50 list and, and, and just, you know, for his, his peak, he was amazing. And obviously, mm-hmm. um, where do you, what, what do you think about, how much do you consider team success? Um, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I think it's pretty important because the best players in in basketball are so important to their teams and really do make such a significant difference. I mean, basketball is obviously a team sport, but those, you know, transcendent great players do mean so much that I do think that there is some – weight should be for, for being you know a a top you know best player or, or top one or two three contributors to you know a championship team multiple championship teams I, I do think that that should some weight should be given to that I'm not I'm not a count the rings guy but I do yeah at least have some basic sympathy for like okay if you're the best player one of the best players in the league you probably should have some championships and with some exceptions obviously yeah, I, uh, I I sort of go both ways. Like I think about a case like Anthony Davis, and um, like this season, you know, he didn't finish uh, in the in you know he sort of wasn't a realistic or a viable MVP candidate for a lot of people because the Pelicans just barely squeaked into the playoffs. Um, ironically, it seemed like that was not as much of an issue for people when it came to Russell Westbrook, um, but but Davis was without a doubt one of the the three best players in the league this year statistically and um you know so i i think it was sort of unfair that he was penalized for having not as great teammates and having teammates who you know struggled with injury all year um on, on the same token when it comes to things like championships and and finals appearances and things like that those things are so uh so influenced by luck and circumstance and health and things like that i feel like i feel like those things can be included but um you know, knocking somebody like Barkley or Malone or Stockton down a couple pegs for not having a ring feels ridiculous to me, particularly in the case of Stockton and Malone, who they played on the best teams in the West for, you know, for so many years. Um, they just happened to, to play against Jordan uh, in those two finals. Um, so I, I think it's, it's sort of a balancing act. I know. So one of the things that you have to account for um, statistically with a statistic like win shares is that it is somewhat the, the formula is somewhat biased towards good teams. So if you are a, uh, a mediocre player on a good team, you will look better by win shares than you would have on a, on a, on a maybe not so good team. Um, and so, um, you know, that's something to take into account. I don't have uh you know, I don't have a sort of a numerical adjustment for that, um, but it, it, it's something to think about. You know, like Carlos Boozer always had strong defensive win shares numbers when he played on the Chicago Bulls because that team was really good. And I, you know, so I, on some level, some of the statistics can sort of overstate a player's uh, skills or, or contributions. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know. I don't know how much you've had a chance to look at the numbers for, you know, the current top 50 players, but are, 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 if, are there any that, you know, who you would look at and, and kind of would be, you know, really surprising either better or worse than you expected? 
Um, I'm looking at the list right now. You sent me earlier some some stats that you and Rich pulled together. I'm surprised that David Robinson's uh, career win shares per 48 are tied with Jordan and that he's at the top of the list. Um, that that sort of surprised me. Um, surprised that Olajuwon's a little bit lower win shares per 48. He sort of falls more in the middle of the pack. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I there's some players here who I just I don't know that much about. You know, players who before my era who I'm not that familiar with. And then I, I see some players on the list who I think of. You know, again, probably recency bias. I, I some players on this list that I'm like, I, I you know I would cross them off and I would put in somebody. I'd put in somebody new. I think of this. You know, a player who I think of as being more. Um, more of sort of a cultural pioneer or sort of having a more off the court kind of contribution to the game. Um, you know, I'm staring at Lenny Wilkins at the bottom. And again, you know, I, I don't know that a ton about him as a player, but I think of him as a coach and I think of him, um, you know, as sort of a cultural pioneer for the game. But, you know, I, I feel like some, some current players statistically could probably, uh, could probably squeeze him, squeeze him off the list. Yeah, he's definitely one where it's sort of. Um, I, I think we would basically kind of agree as as far as it goes. Although he, you know, he was a good player. Um, it does seem like guards from his era, um, like most of them, like Hal Greer as well. Although he, he rates reasonably well, but um, uh, some of the guards, you know, have lower ranks in um, in win shares. Um, and I, I, I don't. I imagine that's mostly because of you know just low shooting, per, low shooting percentages. Um, <laughs> it kind of hurt those uh, players. But yeah, I, you know, one that's always surprised me is Isaiah Thomas being so low. I, I, I <laughs> guess part of it is my perception of when I first really became a basketball fan, which was late '80s, as I <laughs> viewed Isaiah as like you know probably like a top five player in in the league. Um, <laughs> I had relative close proximity to Detroit, so that probably helped a little bit. Um, Mm -hmm. but obviously, you know, he was the, you know, regarded at least as the best player on a team that won back-to-back championships yet, you know, Mm -hmm. and and is still, you know, I mean, I think people consider him one of the, you know, in the conversation for top five point guard of all time, maybe, Mm -hmm. Uh, I feel like I've seen that thrown around yet, you know, numbers wise, you know, it's, it's not quite as impressive. Yeah, you know, he, uh, by the numbers was not much of a three point shooter. And it's interesting too, that he, uh, that he didn't, his career did not last as long as some of his contemporaries. You know, he played almost a hundred fewer games than Jordan, uh, you know, a hundred fewer games than Barkley, um, you know, 300 games less than, than Shaq, you know, 600 games less than, than Stockton. Um, so that, that might be a, a, an issue too. Um, but I think, I think he's one of those players who gets the, you know, and, and not that this is right or wrong, but he gets the benefit of, uh, of the perception. Like he was such a sort of a strong personality on the court and he gave this appearance of being so in control of the game and being such a sort of master orchestrator that, you know, that, that, uh, that, that sort of, uh, overshadows some of the numbers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it is, it's really tough balancing act. I, I, I'm surprised already. And we're, we're not even quite, you know, as d- that deep in the research yet as far as just how you know it's, it's like wow there's just so many things to weigh um yeah but but i mean it's fun i mean i you know the obviously our you know the the journey is going to take us to a point which we're going to pick our our top 50 and we're, we're going <laughs> to weigh that but but really i think the enjoyment is the process of just okay just having an excuse to do research and to look up these guys and just to kind of uh do the sort of thinking of um you know, that, that it takes to just kind of put this together or just to have fun conversations like this. It's, you know, the, the destination itself is almost beside the point. Yeah. <laughs> um, what have you, what do you guys uh, think, or what have you guys talked about, about the, uh, I don't, I have no idea how to handle this statistically, but, um, the idea of of advantages in like in speed and strength, like I'm st- thinking specifically of Chamberlain, who was just, you know, a foot taller than everybody else and so much stronger than everybody else. And, and um, like I know from a statistical standpoint, when he, when you look at his numbers, they look incredible. And it's, I don't know how you account for the fact that he, that his, 
the era that he played in and his sort of winning the genetic lottery gave him such a physical advantage. You know, I don't know how you compare his statistics to, you know, maybe somebody like Hakeem who the statistics are not as good, but Hakeem had to rely on, on quickness and on skill level playing against, you know, players who were essentially the same size as he was. Yeah. And I mean, that, that is difficult. Uh, thing to account for. I mean, I, I I think we're mostly trying to consider the merits of a player within their own era. Um, hmm. and, um, and think about it more that way. Um, I mean, I, I don't think necessarily it's fair to penalize Chamberlain, um, because he played an era where, you know, there were, there were fewer, uh, dominant big men, although, you know, he was facing up against Russell. He was facing up against, um, Nate Thurmond, you know, so, I mean, there were certainly players that, um, you know, that, that, you know, could, could defend him, but it, it, it was definitely a different time. Um, and it was still a league where, you know, the, the athleticism clearly was, was at a different level. Um, he also, he did play in most of his career. He played, you know, among a pool of, you know, there were eight or nine teams. So he's playing, uh, you know, among a pool of, let's say 80 or 90 players where, you know, Elijah Wan is playing in a pool, let's say of 300 players. So they, I think yeah. that creates a different environment too. And you kind of have to kind of consider like, well, you know, maybe, um, you know, Olajuwon is doing something against like a third big man who wouldn't have necessarily been in the league in 1965 or whatever. You know, it's so you, yeah. There's those, there's those things to consider as well, and, and you can you can drive yourself crazy a little bit trying to go too deep down that path. But um, I but it's definitely you know it, it's it's something worth considering. No question. I mean, I, I think you know Wilt would be on. I, I think Wilt be would be great in any era. I mean, I, I think you know mo, for the most part, I think these guys would have ju- just adjusted and um and obviously if they had if they were around later they would have you know had some of the same um been able to take advantage of some of the same strength and development things that you know guys today are able to take advantage yeah yeah it's that that kind of stuff is sort of fascinating to me and i think you know uh statistically there's there's no good answer for that there's statistically there's no good answer for measuring physical differences and style of play and um you know uh, measuring how much easier it would be for a big man to play in an era where there was three pointers and the floor was spaced a little bit better you know things some of those historical things there's just there's not there's not an accounting for in the numbers yeah it, it, exactly and it's um i guess it's just a matter of what you value and what you um you know using the best judgment um so are there players that you know um post-1996 candidates let's say uh who you think might have who who might be a, a surprisingly strong case um either you know by the numbers or maybe just you know based on your own judgment of guys that, you know, you obviously are more familiar with those guys just in general. So is there anyone that you kind of think of that would be, you know, that might be surprising? Um, I think, I think if the league did the list over today, I think LeBron would be on the list. I think Kobe would be on the list. Uh, I think Tim Duncan would be on the list. Um, I think Dirk Nowitzki and Steve Nash would probably have a case. Um, Jason Kidd, maybe. Yeah. Um, Garnett, I think, would definitely be on there. Oh, Garnett. Yeah, Garnett's an obvious one. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe Pierce maybe is on the fringe. Uh, Chris Paul would be an interesting candidate. I don't know. Um, it, he may be somebody who needs a call, you know, to sort of finish out his career to have the resume fully fleshed out. Um, yeah, I don't know. Who else jumps out to you? Uh, well, Wade's another one. Oh, um, Wade. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I, may, you know, after that, you're kind of getting into um, guys who would be worth considering, but I would consider more fringe candidates. But, um, you know, I think Iverson would be um, you know, just because of the um, the influence and, and and the fame would be it w- would probably be on the list, although, you know, his merits are are worth debating another time, I think. But um, well, he's a funny candidate because he has such cultural relevance, but it was also like it was a cultural relevance that the league didn't really like didn't yeah. really want to sort of be out 
front and center. So yeah, yeah it would be interesting to see how they would deal with that. Yeah, I feel like it's it's probably like we have enough distance from that era, and I think just the, kind of the culture's changed a bit. Where I don't think it would be quite as negatively thought of as it was, you know, fifteen years ago. I <laughs> maybe I'm being naive about that, but I'm, that's kind of my thought is that he. Um, is that we have some distance from that. So I think some of his um, uh, rebelliousness can now be uh, appreciated more because it's not so threatening, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so, probably. Uh, Ray Allen, maybe? Yeah. Um, I, Ginobili, I think, is has sort of has an interesting um, case. Um, I, I, we haven't really discussed whether we're considering international play at all, and there aren't really that many guys who that would really make a a big difference for, but I think he would be one that, you know, you, you could throw in there, maybe Pau Gasol as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are, um, I, you know, there's, there's a good number of guys who are, are certainly worth uh, considering, but you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a tough list, obviously, <laughs> you know, we already have a lot of uh, worthy guys on there. So, um, you know, other than, I, I think, you know, we kind of have, you know, uh, five or six shoe ins. After that, it's mm-hmm. you know it it, it it becomes really tough. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I don't envy having to make the selection. So you know, let's say you have five or six people who are coming on. Who are the five or six who who drop off the list? I, I mean, that's tough. I mean, we we, we kind of um you know it may, it may end up being more. I mean, I, I think we're we're gonna oh. wait a lot of guys just to kind of you know consider that, but um. <laughs> I, I don't think I think Bill Walton is a just because of just you know he he played you know like probably three four hundred less games than just about anybody um, on the list I think um, and really was only an elite player for a couple of seasons I think he might be off the list um, you know uh, Dave Bing and Maravich are guys who um, just. Um, their reputations are probably uh, better than their actual play was. Um, Maravich certainly had, you know, some of the cultural influence and and oh. and just the, the the flashiness and the highlights, you know, kind of add some. I think that adds something, but I ultimately don't think that's enough. Um, you know, maybe James Worthy, who um, was a you know obviously an important contributor to an elite team, but. You know, if if you're making that argument, he's behind. He's definitely behind a guy like um, um, like McHale, and, and and pretty solidly behind a guy like uh, Parrish as well. Um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think those are the, those are the kind of the first guys who I would lean toward uh, knocking off the list. But um, you know, it, 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 yeah, I mean, those are obviously important, very good. Uh, you know, great pleasure. Earl Monroe would be another one who would, I think, kind of be in that in that category as well of a guy who, um, you know, because he was colorful, because of, partly because of being on those Knicks teams, he gets a shine that, that I think a little bit more than you know his his productivity was just that he deserves. Mm-hmm. It's funny too to think about players who sort of get a bump not just from being on good teams, but being on sort of those like those like sort of like signature teams, like those seventies Knicks. Um, the 1970 Knicks, um, you know, or the Walton with those trailblazers, you know, um, that they're, you know, there's there's good teams every year, but there's, you know, there's a few teams who sort of stand out in our memory. And yeah, I wonder if, uh, I wonder if Monroe's getting a bump from that. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I think there, I mean, I think there, there are four players on those, um, sixties Knicks that are, or seventies Knicks, excuse me, that are on this list. So, which I, I mean, I, you know, Walt Frazier's clearly uh, belongs, and mm-hmm. uh, Willis Reed clearly belongs, and I mean, DeBusher, he, his numbers don't grade out well, but he, you know, he was an incredible defender, and you know, you, you can you can definitely you know see why he would have been put on there. Um, and and, and Moreau, you know, he was obvious, you know, he um, he was an incredible player, just you know, um, his production, you know, just was a little bit less than uh, than then some probably some other deserving guys are on there but you know again you know you with the goals that they had in mind you can definitely see why he you know belongs to this. and i would say our goals are fairly similar we we may weigh kind of you know we may weigh the numbers a little more heavily than these guys did but understandably these were guys mostly who played in the league some you know some sports writers some um you know 
executives. So their perspective is going to be different. And, you know, our, our hope is just to kind of, it obviously is, is to have fun and also to sort of um, maybe um, challenge some, you know, some assumptions that might, that, that might have historically been made and just examine like, Oh, is that really the case? Or in, in, in some cases it'll obviously confirm it. And in other cases, maybe we'll, you know, spur some thought into uh, challenging it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's. <laughs> I'm. I'm actually glad I don't have to make my own <laughs> list. I'm staring at this and looking at all the tough decisions. Yeah. 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 Um. So. Uh. So. Ian, anything else before we uh, before we wrap up? No, I think that's it. I know this went went kind of quickly, but uh, yeah. I think I'm out of ideas right now. All right. Well, I uh, appreciate you uh, joining in. Uh, definitely uh, great to get your thoughts. Definitely wanted to get your uh, your take on this. And uh, I, I think you're, you, you may uh, rejoin us to talk about a, a couple of the players that we're going to look into a little bit more deeply here on in the future. So looking forward to that and to all the, the stuff that we do. And yeah. Um, and everyone, uh, thanks so much for uh, uh, checking us out. Uh, you can find us. We're part of the uh, uh, Hardwood Paroxysm family, the Podium Game Network. Uh, you can find uh, you can find our show on iTunes. Please uh, leave a rating and review. That's a way that you can uh, definitely uh, uh, help other people find us and all the other great podcasts on the network. And uh, find us on Twitter uh, at Over and Back NBA. Uh, also on uh, Facebook. So. Uh, so uh so check those places out and uh we'll be back again soon. Thanks so much. <laughs>